This is Stan's website where he promotes himself as an apostle, a teacher of Bible prophecy, a producer of many interviews and DVDs. So let's have a look and see how Stan stacks up. Welcome to the Prophecy Club. Our topic today is the one single verse that kills pre-trib. I said that right. I'm going to show you one verse that absolutely, positively drives a wooden stake into the belief that there's going to be a time when Jesus returns in the clouds and sucks everybody off of the earth that is a good person so they don't have to be tested. They don't have to go through the tribulation. I'm going to show you one verse and you'll probably look at it and you'll say, huh, I don't understand. Uh, that's exactly the point. <laughs> you won't understand until I explain it to you. The basis of my concerns about Stan's message are these. Number one, date setting is forbidden by Jesus Christ. Number two, Stan claims the tribulation is not the wrath of God. Number three, Stan uses Revelation 14 verse 4 to relate to Leviticus 23.10. Number four, Stan claims the 144,000 in Revelation 14 refers to one-year-old Jewish infants. And number five, Stan claims that eternity commences when Christ returns at the second coming. Claim number one, no date setting allowed. Please note at the bottom of this image that Stan presents he has dates nominated for when certain events occur. These dates in the image are listed to the left. Again, claim number one, no date setting allowed. Please note that Jesus Christ plainly stated, But of that day and hour of his return to the earth knoweth no man, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. However, Stan prefers to call Jesus Christ a liar, by his date setting as shown in this image that he produced. Claim number two, that the tribulation is not the wrath of God. Firstly, the wrath of God is brought upon the inhabitants of this world by the events indicated on the right. These announce God's wrath being poured upon the inhabitants of this world from the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven vile judgments. So the above above 21 judgments represent the wrath of God being inflicted upon the ungodly inhabitants of this world throughout this seven year period. So a few examples follow. So to counter Stan's claim that the tribulation is not the wrath of God, the first vial that's poured out by the angel represents a smelly and grievous sore upon those which had the mark of the beast. The second vial is on the sea and it became as blood and fish and all things in the sea died. The third vial is poured out on the rivers and the fountains of waters and they became as blood and obviously fish died. Fourth vial is it poured on the sun and it's intensified so much that it will scorch men with fire. The fifth vial is poured out on the beast kingdom and it creates uh, great darkness and the people in uh, Antichrist kingdom use their tongues for pain. And the sixth vial represents the Euphrates River being dried up and preparing the armies for the battle at Armageddon. And the seventh vial is a great voice is heard out of the throne in heaven saying, It is done. So all the references here are found in Revelation chapter 16. So what more is needed to convince Stan that these seven judgments alone represent the wrath of God? An example of the tribulation being the wrath of God is shown below in Romans 1.18. It clearly states that the wrath of God is poured upon those who are ungodly and unrighteous and who hold the truth presented to them in unrighteousness. This is the basis of why God is angry with those in the church who Quote, hold the truth of what is written in his word in unrighteousness. Here in this slide is another example of the wrath of God being fulfilled in uh, the book of Revelation. 
And it says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, these are the seven vile judgments, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. This clearly states that the wrath of God does occur during the tribulation, which is in contradiction to Stan's claim. And what's even more disturbing is they speak of this as if they're going as we're going to fly away and not have to endure the wrath of the Lord. But here's where they're wrong. Stan confusing the wrath of the Lord, which they say starts with the tribulation, wrong. The wrath of the Lord is the morning star coming down on the Feast of Trumpets at the last trump, just like the Bible says. In one hour, less than 24 hours, is the wrath of God. The tribulation is not the wrath of God. Again, Revelation 16, 1 clearly states that the seven angels were to pour out the vials of the wrath of God, which again proves Stan's claim to be false. Claim number three, which is Stan's misuse of the term first fruits. In Stan's single verse of Revelation 14, 4, shown that he uses to nullify the rapture, he bases his claim on the 144,000 Jewish males being the first fruits unto God that can be associated with Revelation 7 at the bottom. Spiritually speaking, as the true Christian church is associated with ten virgins that remained undefiled from idolatrous religions, so these 144,000 Jewish men remain undefiled, meaning much the same as virgins, from Judaism and Antichrist religions, because they were sealed by God, a feature here which Stan failed to acknowledge. Here's the big one. These are they which are not defiled with women for their virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb. Wait, 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 wait. Follow the Lamb? Follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth? What does that mean? These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in the mouth is found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, the key here is this. These were redeemed from among men. Okay, what does that mean? Remain. It means that these were pulled out of the ground, redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God. In other words, these are the first people. These 144,000 are the first people to come out of the grave that are part of the harvest. You got a scripture on that? Yes, I do. I'll show you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm probably coming across very arrogant, and probably very attacking, so I'll apologize, but I can't. I'm so frustrated with the lie of the pre-trib and pastors that put it out. I, really, I want to believe that you put it out because it's the only particular position you've ever seen. But after this, you won't be able to say that. These were redeemed from among men means that they were pulled out of the ground, the resurrected, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. Now, let's jump to where that's talking about. See this word, first fruits, right here, okay? That is the secret door. Now I'll show you that where that comes from. Let's jump back to Levit Leviticus 23.10. Moses is told, Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, you shall reap a harvest thereof. So the harvest in this case is also hinting at the last day's harvest. But it's also talking about it's literally a fulfillment there. Reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a, a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. You shall wave the sheaf before the Lord and be accepted to you on the morrow. After the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. You shall offer that day when you hear, you want to know who the 144,000 are? It's about to tell you. You shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf a he lamb without blemish of the first year. So what it's saying is that the first fruit sacrifice is to pick a sheaf of wheat, excuse me, pick a sheaf of barley and wave it before the Lord, and that is part of the first fruits. But the next part of the first fruits is they also had to sacrifice a he lamb without blemish of the first year. Now we know that Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of that, but the initial fulfillment was an actual lamb. But the final fulfillment is right back here, where it says 144,000 of all the tribes and children of Israel. In other words, what is resurrected right here and 
get my scriptures right, here, what is resurrected is 144,000 one-year-old Jewish boys. Uh, excuse me, Stan. You have just said that, quote, a sheaf of barley must be waved before the Lord. So if the he lamb represents the 144,000 one-year-old Jewish infants as you claim, how are all these infants going to be waved before the Lord so as to comply with the requirements of Leviticus 23 verse 10 and verse 12? Also, how are they to be sacrificed before God to comply with the requirements of Leviticus 23.12 as them being a burnt offering unto the Lord? Please explain, Stan. Claim number four, the first fruits being one-year-old babies. Therefore, Stan would have people believe that, firstly, the first fruits of the 144,000 Jews accepting Christ during the tribulation are one-year-old Jewish boys. This makes no sense at all. For these reasons, toddlers need their mothers for various dependency reasons. Toddlers cannot walk for 50 days from Passover to Pentecost, as Stan would have us believe. And babies in God's kingdom must be drawn from the breasts of their spiritual mothers, as shown in Isaiah 28 verse 9. Whom shall I teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Similarly, Stan would also have people believe that these 144,000 Jewish boys are virgins, possibly due to their age. Such a concept is madness. God speaks a lot about his people remaining pure and undefiled, that's quoted in James 1 verse 7, or as virgins are expected to be prior to their marriage. During the tribulation, Antichrist's one world religion will be forced upon all of the world's people. That's stated in Revelation 13 verse 15. These 144,000 Jewish men will resist this in the same manner as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego did in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar when he threw them into the fiery furnace and the Lord rescued them. Claim number five. Eternity commences at the second coming. On Stan's website, he has his beliefs listed. And item 13 on that list says, Section 13, The Millennial Reign of Christ. The return of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints to rule and reign for 1,000 years on earth as the scriptures promised. After this, there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. Now I agree with that statement. However, in Stan's video, it seems that he has rejected the millennial reign of Christ by dis discarding this statement and instead he's assumed eternity commences when Christ returns at the second coming. If you listen to the video that follows where Stan explains his diagram, he says at the end, After Armageddon, we return at the seventh trumpet or the last trump. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we that are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Eternity starts on that day. Then, on Pentecost, we all go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, both the wheat and the barley. Go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and Jesus comes forth and he serves us. Then about four months later, uh, for Armageddon, we return to the seventh trumpet, or the last trump, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the air to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. It means eternity starts on that day. <laughs> the problem I have with eternity starts on that day is this. Stan's website states that there is a thousand year millennial reign of Christ on the earth, which I agree to, as shown previously. For Stan to claim there is a 1000 year rule and reign of Christ on the earth, 
on his website and then contradicts that by saying that eternity starts on that day, meaning September the 9th, 2029, is absurd. In the presentation that follows, I will describe in some detail what the pre-tribulation rep represents. Firstly, the seven-year tribulation represents that final week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Number two, God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. Number three, history reveals the righteous are removed from the earth before God's judgments follow. Number four, the tribulation is for God to purify the Jews to himself and Christ. And number five, the 144,000 Jews are mature aged men who have kept their faith in Christ their Messiah pure throughout the first half of the tribulation. Before commencing this presentation, the above chart illustrates that throughout the various dispensations where God requires mankind to obey certain requirements that he has established, it can be seen that those who obey God's commandments, meaning the saints, go to paradise in hell, as depicted in Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16, prior to Christ's uh, first appearance on the earth, or to their mansion in heaven since Christ's resurrection. In contrast to this, all sinners, Christian or otherwise, end up in Hades, also known as hell, to await the final judgment. This 24th verse of Daniel chapter 9 is the heart of God's dealings with Israel leading up to Christ's crucifixion and of the final seven years of the tribulation period. In this, God says to Israel, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people Israel and upon thy holy city Jerusalem to finish the transgression caused at the cross of Calvary and to make an end of sins of this nation against me and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The chart here represents the various time periods that describes how God intends to purify the Jews over a 490 year period. Separating the 69th and the 70th week is the 2000 year period that the church has been in existence. The 70th week is waiting to be triggered by a prophetic event to allow God to commence his dealings with Israel as prophesied. Now this image of the planetary alignment of stars in the constellations of Virgo and Leo first appeared on the internet in 2015, but the event occurred on September the 23rd, 2017. It is worth watching this video to appreciate God's perfect timing of these planets which is used to confirm the birth of the man-child mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, which I believe announced the birth of the man-child mentioned in Revelation chapters 7 and 14. A copy of the link to this video can be found in the description box below. In the middle of the chart, the rapture of the church is shown. This is where Christ removes his saints from the earth in a similar manner as Noah and Lot were removed from harm's way in their days when God brought forth his judgment upon the ungodly people of this world. After this, it is believed the man-child commences preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jews shown in the purple arrow, and they do this throughout all of Israel. When the Antichrist breaks the peace covenant with Israel, the man-child is raptured by God into heaven, and their evangelism to the Jews is replaced by the two witnesses for the final three and a half years of the tribulation. So, in the previous lesson, we learned that an undefined period shown as the midnight cry on the chart below commences after the peace covenant with Israel is signed by the Antichrist with Israel's leaders. This event triggers the wise virgins to alert the foolish virgins in today's churches 
But the United Nations envoy, meaning who sought, the one who signed the peace covenant with Israel, is the Antichrist. And this is as demonstrated by the various ways the number of his name adds up. This period of the midnight cry is indicated in the chart below. And so in this chart, um, just very briefly, we've got World War Three is, is probably likely to happen. Every day there's news. Um, we heard something on the news tonight that Donald Trump's now closed the Chinese embassy in Texas and the Chinese are very unhappy about that. So, you know, we, we could be edging to World War Three very soon with the Chinese. Um, but there will also be well, uh, the Psalm 83 war uh, happening at the same time. And this will bring Antichrist to sign a peace covenant with Israel on behalf of the Arabs because the Arabs will be largely overthrown from their lands. And this, there's Antichrist there, which was the first seal of the seven seals. And then this will then trigger the wise virgins, adding up the number of his name, the midnight cry going out to say this is the Antichrist. So we don't know how long that period will be. But God the Father will then tell Jesus to come back into the clouds. So he's up here in the clouds. And then there will be the shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. And then they will ascend up into the clouds to meet the Lord. And then there's another period here. Now, we don't know what time that period is, but it could be minutes, seconds, minutes, hours. It might even be a day when then we hear the, 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 the last trump. And then when the last trump sounds, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in into the cloud to meet the Lord in the in the clouds. So this means the wise virgins have disappeared from the earth, the foolish virgins are left behind, and this is when the persecu Christian persecution begins with beheadings. Okay. So that's what that chart Amen. means, and it's very significant. Now at the end of this midnight cry period, God the Father determines that it is time for Christ as the bridegroom in the parable to travel from heaven to the clouds above the earth to receive his bride, who represent the wise virgins, both dead and alive, and to bring them back to heaven with him. This chart spans the period between Christ's death on the cross and when the millennium commences, a period which Dan completely ignores in his video presentation. Please notice along the baseline, the scripture references from the book of Daniel, where all the days were obtained that associate with the events mentioned in the Bible. The verses below prove that God does not judge the wicked and the righteous together or at the same time. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. And in Genesis 18 verses 24 to 26, Abraham said to the Lord, Peradventure if there be fifty righteous within the city of Sodom, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place of fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay, meaning or to judge the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be treated as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom and fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. This proves that God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. An example of God sparing the righteous from his judgment with the wicked is shown with Noah, who was saved from a worldwide flood by God providing the ark. But as in the days of Noah, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
So here is one clear example of God separating the righteous from the wicked when he brings forth his judgment. A second example of God sparing the righteous from his judgment upon the wicked is of Lot and his two daughters who were saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by God's angels. So Jesus said in Luke 17, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat and they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Therefore the tribulation is for the Jews to come back to God and it's not just for the judgment of people on the earth. There are many ministries today promoting the concept that Christians have to go through the tribulation on the following basis, and that we, meaning Christians, must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God, in Acts 14. It is the devil's plan for Christians to ignore the rapture and focus more on getting through the seven-year tribulation. Only a few foolish Christians whose faith survives any times into the tribulation will make it to heaven only on the following basis. And in Revelation 20 verse 4 it says, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had they received a mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So it's important that Christians fully understand the, the, the teaching about the rapture and what the tribulation is for. Also, Christianity is symbolised uh, by the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins mentioned by Jesus. So in Matthew 25... It indicates that only the wise virgins go to with Jesus into heaven in the rapture. And in Matthew 25, 10 to 13, it says, And while they, that's the foolish virgins, went to buy more oil for their lamps, the bridegroom, meaning Jesus, came in the clouds, and they, meaning the wise virgins that were ready, went in with him to the marriage supper that's to be held in heaven. And the door of heaven, as stated in Revelation 4 verse 1, was shut. Afterward came also the other foolish virgins in prayer, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us too. But he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. This means that only God the Father knows the day and the hour when Jesus will come to the earth. Finally, to look at the man-child mentioned in Revelation 7 and verse 14. The Bible indicates Israel's man-child is on earth throughout all first six trumpets that are heard in heaven immediately after the catching up of the man-child at the seventh trumpet. The 144,000, or the man-child, are saved, possibly by each Jew preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout Israel during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Since they are seen in heaven during the last three and a half years of the tribulation, their translation, or rapture, must be the same as that of the man-child spoken of in Revelation 12 verse 5, meaning the constellations in the heavens, which occurs in the middle of the tribulation. As there is much more Bible information that is needed to fully understand this topic of end times, I encourage you to watch the two Bible studies shown here, where I describe the meaning of the symbols associated with the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, and how Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy associates with the rapture. Links are provided in the description box below. There are many false gospels about today, but there is only one gospel that Jesus Christ will use to judge Christians by 
as stated by the Apostle Paul in Romans 2 verse 16. The upper diagram indicates the stages in which a fruit producing plant grows from a seed into a mature plant. Similarly, God requires Christians to grow in a spiritual sense from the seed of the gospel into a mature Christian represented as either a little child, a strong young man, a father and a good soldier of Jesus Christ, shown in stages 5 to 8 in the lower illustration. If any of these stages of growth have not been met, then the Christian has not achieved their newborn state which is stage three. Please click on the link below to understand more about the Apostle Paul's gospel that I have termed initial and final salvation.